Are you ready for some good news? Though the whole world, the whole atmosphere seems full of shame and people say, shame on you, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Well, I'd be ashamed. The gospel of Jesus Christ has something altogether different to say. Shame off you. In Jesus Christ, you can have the shame taken off of you. We're in a series called No Worries, and we come today to one of the deepest sources of angst in the cosmos, maybe the greatest source of our anxiety, this idea of shame. And we pick up today reading from the earliest account of a man and a woman, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, in the second chapter of your Bible, Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 25. The last verse of Genesis chapter 2, we read, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you'll not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. Shame's all around us. (laughs) I don't know where I came upon this years ago. I pull it out every so often. A lady wrote, the other day I went up to the local Christian bookstore where I saw a honk if you love Jesus bumper sticker. I was feeling particularly sassy that day because I'd come from a thrilling choir performance at church. So I bought that bumper sticker and put it on the back bumper of my car. And I'm really glad that I did, too. What an uplifting experience followed. I was stopped at the light of a busy intersection, just lost in thought about the Lord, and didn't notice that the light had changed. It's a good thing someone else loved Jesus, or I may have never noticed that the light had changed. (laughs) But then I found that lots of people love Jesus. Why, the guy behind me started to honk like crazy. And then he leaned out of his window and screamed, For the love of God, go. Go, Jesus Christ, go. Everyone was honking, so I leaned out my window and waved and smiled at all those loving people. I even honked my horn a few times to share in the love. There must have been a man from Florida back there because I could hear him yelling something about a sunny beach. I saw another, you'll get it later. I saw another guy waving in a funny way with just his middle finger. I asked my teenage son what this meant, and he said it was probably a Hawaiian good luck sign or something. Well, I've never even met a person from Hawaii, so I leaned out the window and gave him the good luck sign back. My son burst into laughter. Why, even he was enjoying this religious experience. A couple of people were so caught up in the joy of the moment that they got out of their cars and started walking towards me. I bet they wanted to pray or ask what church I attended. But that's when I noted the light, noted that the light had changed, and I waved one more time to my brothers and sisters in the Lord and drove through the intersection. I was the only car that got through the intersection before the light changed again. Felt kind of bad that I had to lead them, leave them like that and all the love that we'd shared. So I slowed down, leaned out the car, and gave them the Hawaiian good luck sign for one more time. <laughs> You don't have to look very far, do you, for the world to uh, give you some shame. It's like it's in the atmosphere. But I want to show you today, that doesn't mean you have to breathe it in. Shame is essentially a diabolical lie that says, as you are now, 
you are not acceptable. You don't measure up. And until you can measure up, you can't be perfectly loved or accepted. So you better start trying to measure up. And the problem is, who amongst us could ever measure up to any standard? And so what happens is that between the idea of what we're supposed to be, what I ought to be, and what I am, there's a gap. And in that gap between what I ought to be and where I am now and how I feel like I need to measure up, but in that gap, I think, is where hell works to create maybe the greatest source of anxiety in the whole cosmos. Because you're always wondering, if I have to measure up in order to be accepted, what happens if I can't measure up? And that's the way shame works. And what we see in today's primal story of the first man and woman is that as soon as sin came in the world, shame came into the world, and that shame immediately produced within them anxiety. If you could heal the shame, the anxiety will go away. We often spend time trying to manage our worries and our angst. But I think what God's inviting us into again today is an experience of his grace so rich that anxiety melts away on its own. Years ago, before I really began learning much about shame, uh, a subject which would become a life message for me and be a source of a book and untold number of conferences around the nation, I remember... I was actually away for a weekend with my wife, and I was, after a nice breakfast, just reading the newspaper at this nice hotel. And it was during a time that Saddam Hussein had been ousted and was finally, though not captured, it was finally believed by the Iraqi people that he was never going to be in leadership again, that he was truly gone. And so people began to speak out. And this particular article I was reading was about soccer players on the Iraqi national soccer team. It was stunning to me because they said that before every game, Saddam's nephew, I guess it was, Uday Hussein, would contact the team and threaten them with punishment if they should lose. The star of the team, a national hero, said, I love to play soccer, but I hated playing for Uday Hussein. After important matches, if they lost, they were taken to something that was like a prison camp, almost like you think of a concentration camp. And they were variously punished, including at times beaten severely. The star of the team said, I thought many times about quitting, but the Husseins had threatened my family's well-being if I ever quit. And I was sitting there just reading about this story on the other side of the world about how, how grievous it was. And it made me sad to think of people playing soccer, not for the fun of the game, but because they were under such pressure. But something in me began to really grip me. I mean, you ever had something like that? Like, this is moving me more than what I would expect. And I've learned over the years that sometimes that's the Holy Spirit teaching me something. And so I paused and I said, Lord, why am I so gripped by this? I felt a deep grief about this. And the Lord, I believe, showed me in that moment because, Alan, you've lived a lot of your life like that. And that was when I began to realize that shame was like a hidden tyrant somewhere down deep in my soul. It came maybe from the brokenness I experienced in my family from the time I was in fourth grade, the alcohol abuse that was in our family, the shame that I experienced about that. Nobody ever said, Alan, unless you perform well, you're not going to be loved. Nobody ever said that. And, And by most measures, I received a lot of love. 
But there was something inside of me that was driving me. And I stopped and I said, am I living my life? Am I, am I striving hard? Am I working hard? Am I, am I serving the Lord even because of the love of the game or because there's some other pressure that's there? And that's when I realized that there was something that was driving me and it wasn't healthy. And I began to learn about shame. One of the things that I think is important for all of us to do, I did many, many years ago I'm talking about now, and I took an honest self-inventory to think, well, what is, what is it that's producing some of the things I don't like about myself? Here were a few. I took a self-inventory, and I, I realized that I was overly sensitive. If somebody said something critical to me, it bothered me too much. I, I might think about it for a long time. And I, even like if... If even when I was serving in the ministry, and it could be hundreds of people walk out and say something uh, about how the Lord used that message for them, and then somebody sent me one critical note, and I find myself brooding of it. I'm like, why am, I, why am I paying so much attention and feeling so sensitive? What is that inside of me? I, I didn't like that. It, it wasn't just that, but I, I would sometimes mistake remarks as a criticism. I, was, I laugh at my wife about it now, but it's like it was rough on our marriage because she, she might say, Alan, the garbage needs to go out, which was my job. But she said, the trash needs to go out. And something inside my mind filtered it into, and if you were a better husband, you'd have already taken it out by now. You know? I interpreted it through the filter of shame, and so it came across as a criticism when it really was just her saying, trash needs to go out. And it's a hard way to live if you're always filtering things in such a way that you're either sensitive to it or it pushes some button inside of you. I didn't like that. I, I found in my self-inventory, I was, I was too driven to do more. We, we look back and laugh about it now, but our first church, when we got there, they had 117 on the roll. We couldn't find them all. There were only about 50 of them. And I get in there, and I'm working 60 hours a week. My wife's looking at me, what are you doing? She said, you, 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 you got a small little church here, and, and I never even see you. Well, I was just, I was so driven. I was going to be the perfect pastor. I was going to make sure I was absolutely driven, perfect to do everything. Why was I, all, why did I always have to do more? And I had a really hard time ever really resting. I found out in this self-inventory that I had to admit to myself, I had a hard time saying no. What, what was it about, I didn't understand at that time anything about boundaries or, or I, why, but why I knew this. It was real hard for me to ever say no to something. And listen, beloved, if you can't say no to the things that God hasn't called you to do, how can you say yes to the things he has called you to do? I didn't understand about that. And, and, and even when God was blessing and using me, there was a little part of me that just felt like an imposter. Where do those imposter feelings come from? It was like there was this hidden dictator in my unconscious being that was dictating a lot of things in my life. There's so much under the surface in our souls that is determining how we think and how we live. And I did not want to go through my whole life just trying to manage all of that. I wanted to get at the root. It's worth it. If you identify with any of those things, it's worth it. I wanted to change. And so I started learning about this and how the grace of God could set us free. When I first began studying, I was so taken by this. There's only one thing that we know about a relationship in paradise. Only one thing that the Lord and all the scripture chose to tell us about Adam and Eve before sin had ever entered the world. Only one sentence, Genesis 2 verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. There was zero shame in paradise. That's what paradise is, the place where there is no shame. Zero pressure to perform. It just is almost hard to imagine. We don't know what Adam and Eve did all day long. They, we don't know all, all that their conversation. We wish, wish that we did. But what this means is that when there's no shame, that when Eve would say, Adam, how do I look? And he said, Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She didn't take that to mean you're bony or maybe a little too fleshy. She just took it as the compliment that it was. It means that when Adam said, how do you like my row of carrots that I've been sowing in the ground and how they're growing? And she said, nice. 
It meant that he didn't walk away from it and say, well, why did she say nice? Why didn't she say great? Why didn't she say spectacular? Why did she just say nice? Maybe she doesn't think I'm that good after all. There was none of that. There were no billboards or commercials that were postering pictures of women for Adam to compare Eve to. She never felt any pressure Adam never had Eve bring up to her some flaw of his that made him feel like he was less of a man. It was just a place of paradise because there was no shame. If you've ever tasted a moment where there is no shame, you know it is heavenly. Ann and I, at the end of the sabbatical, we were given so graciously this summer. We, I took two weeks off from writing, about 10 days of travel. And Ann and I just traveled up into uh, Vermont and drove all the way up into Canada. And we never said to each other, hey, listen, we got 10 days together. Let's just make sure we don't do anything to shame each other. Let's just enjoy it. We just both went and go, you know, this is a gift from God. Let's just enjoy this. And so it, it, was, it was really a wonderful, wonderful, t- almost felt like another honeymoon. And, and it, it was just sort of an unwritten rule that right now we're not, we're not, we're not working on, on trying to correct anything in the other, you know. We're just, uh, so even when uh, I drove into Canada and had not prepared adequately to know uh, the, the GPS, how it was supposed to work, and it didn't work, and instead it pointed us in some back roads and we got lost on the way to Quebec, and we're in French-speaking area and rural areas and um, with no map. Uh, even then, Anne didn't say, well, why didn't you figure this out better? That's your job. We just finally figured out a way to look on the phone and see a map and found our way. Even when we were outside eating in old Quebec City at a fondue restaurant on that beautiful evening, And I ate all the chocolate fondue myself. (laughs) She didn't say, are you sure you're going to eat that entire pot of fondue? We just let it go, you know what I'm saying. Just, it's just so sweet. If you could just be in an environment where nobody's judging you, condemning you, pressuring you, or shaming you in any way. We get little fleeting moments of it. I wish it could last. It made me think back to our honeymoon. Honeymoon, as much as any time in life, is a time where there's no pressure on you. Nobody calls you up on your honeymoon and says, have you been doing any work this week? Have you gotten that project done? Nobody will ever bother you on your honeymoon. And you have just said, I do, and she said, I do, and you're just fresh in this covenant of love and the honeymoon. Oh, it was just wonderful. We, courtesy of The Price is Right, that's another story, flew out to New Orleans, and for the first time in my life, we stayed in a nice hotel. I'd stayed in a lot of Motel 6s in my life and camped, but this was the Sheraton in the French Quarter of New Orleans, and we rented a car. I think it was the first time I'd ever rented a car, pulled up to the fancy hotel, Never had I had uh, valet parking before. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to tip. I didn't know how to act. And it was obvious. And I looked like a kid. And I remember the valet attendant just looking down at the two of us and with this little smile saying, honeymoons, honeymooners. And I'm like, yes. And I felt ashamed that I was so naive. We went up to the, to the room and it was the first time they had just recently come out with these magnetic keys that you now see even in the cheapest hotels, but it was only the fancy ones. And I didn't know how to work it. I wanted to just carry her across the threshold, but I was just struggling to get into the room. We came back to uh, the room after a lovely dinner one night, and there was some sounds, music or something, voices playing in the room. And I thought, Ann said, there's somebody in the room. And so I was nervous as could be, and I said, I bravely went on in to see who was in the room. Nobody was there, but obviously the room had been disturbed. Something had happened to the bed. The TV was playing, and she said, call downstairs. Tell them. I picked up the phone. I called. I said, someone has been in our room, and as I was talking to the front desk clerk, I looked on the pillows and saw chocolate mints and thought, why would a thief put chocolate mints on our pillows? And they told me, just our nightly turndown service. I said, oh, yeah, I acted like... 
yeah, oh, I forgot about that. Never had heard of such a thing as that. And I felt ashamed that I was night. I'm just saying, even in the most blissful moments, even on my honeymoon, even, it's like it just tries to sneak in. And what happens is that as soon as we feel ashamed, we start feeling anxious. That's what happened to Adam and Eve right from the beginning. Genesis 3, verse 7, we read, The eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Why are they hiding? We're told. At verse 9, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid... I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid myself. See, what happens when we're afraid is we want to cover up. Think of it this way. If shame is this diabolical lie that says you don't measure up because you're, you're not good enough yet, you haven't proven yourself enough to be acceptable, and you're sitting here going, but I don't know if I ever can be, what's your first instinct to try to get rid of the anxiety, the first instinct is to try to cover up any of your flaws. I just won't let people see anything that's wrong with me. And then I'll feel covered and less ashamed. There are so many ways of covering ourselves. One way is my chosen path was I'll cover myself by I'll do everything I can to prove that I do measure up. And I'll just, you need me to run harder, I'll run harder. You need me to jump higher, I'll just jump higher. I felt like I was one of those greyhound dogs that uh, chasing that mechanical rabbit. And it was like that mechanical rabbit just keeps moving in front of the fastest dogs on the planet. And they chase it and they chase it and they chase it. If I could just get that rabbit and no dog ever gets the rabbit. And that rabbit for me was love and acceptance. And it just felt like it was always moving. No matter how much I performed, it always would move. And it probably was mainly in my own mind that I was moving it. But other people will move it on you too. Chances are you'll find out there's somebody that if you will run faster, if they withhold their love, they'll withhold it. Other people don't try to cover up by being perfect. They try to cover up by not trying at all. Listen, people that are in utter rebellion, people that the student says, I'm not going to study, I'm not even going to go to class. It's just another way of covering up the same shame that led me to be a straight A student. It's just another way of saying, if I try and I fail, then I'll feel so ashamed. But if I don't try at all, then I won't feel that. I'll just cover myself up with chronic failure. Whichever way we try to cover ourselves, though, we're still anxious. We worry about what others think of us because we'll feel more ashamed if they look down on us. We worry about whether we've done enough because we don't want to feel shamed if someone disapproves of the job we've done. We worry about whether our past mistakes are going to make us lose face with others, and so we cover up our past mistakes. We worry about upcoming assignments and tests and parties that we're hosting and anything that you could imagine because we're worried if we don't do well enough then we will be ashamed and we worry about trying new things because we're afraid if we stumble then we'll feel ashamed and the feeling of shame is so awful we'll do almost anything in the world to avoid it Adam and Eve covered themselves and we'll try to cover our shame in any way we can and sometimes the way we cover it gets even more destructive and we misuse substances or we abuse relationships or we abuse our own lives all in an attempt to not feel so anxious. And Jesus came to give us a different way. Jesus came as a second Adam who was utterly shame-proof to take the shame from us so that you can live your life not motivated by the fear of messing up, Not motivated by the anxiety of shame, but motivated by assurance of the love of God. People who really, really understand the grace of God in their lives, who are set free from shame and know what Jesus has done for them, those hearts get so full of faith that they get to live life trying harder than anybody 
but out of joy and gratitude and expectancy. When I was growing up, one of the things that was a paradox in my life was the taking of academic tests. I say a paradox because it seems like these two things don't go together. On the one hand, I loved the test because I was good at it, and I would generally make an A, and it was almost like a drug to get another A. And I, I not only wanted to make an A, I wanted to have the highest grade in the class. And yet, on the other hand, I hated tests. My stomach would churn. I, in college, I'd stay up uh, sometimes the whole night just cramming stuff in so I could regurgitate on the test, forget most of the stuff because I was just studying for the test and all of that. By the time we had kids, and I had started learning all about this and about the grace of God, and, and, and I been, started being set free of shame, I did not want to raise my kids in that. And uh, starting from second grade, for a lot of different reasons, we homeschooled, and it gave us the advantage of being able to shape the environment that our kids were in. And one of the things we didn't do in homeschool was give tests. We, we just wanted our kids to have the joy of learning. And I know eventually later in their lives that you've got to learn to take tests, and you're going to take tests, and, and they did become skilled at that. But for many, many years, we didn't take tests except once a year. Because the state of North Carolina requires, rightly so, that homeschool families administer at least once a year a standardized test to assess where their children are. And so when Ben was in second grade and he hadn't ever taken any tests and we had uh, uh, arranged uh, to hire a, someone to come in and give him some standardized tests. Uh, and, he, and we told him it was coming. And inside of me, I'm feeling kind of nervous for him because he's, got to, he's going to sit there and have a full morning of somebody sitting down with him and going over these tests and he's going to sit there and take tests all morning. And I'm just thinking to myself, oh, you know. Well, the night before the test, we we're going to bed, and every night our ritual was included that we each share two blessings, two things we're thankful for before we go to bed. And Bennett shared something he was thankful for playing, you know, with his toys that day or something. I said, and what's your second blessing? And he thought and he thought, and he said, oh, tomorrow I get to take those tests. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. I thought, whose boy is this? And what does that even feel like to look forward to taking the test? I think to this very day in law school, Bennett still sort of enjoys taking a test. There's only one way that you could ever feel that way. There's only one way. You have to be unconditionally loved and fully accepted so you know that no matter how well you do or don't do, that you're just taking an exercise of faith and trying to show what you've learned. And that can be fun. This is the way God wants us to live. How would God feel about Adam and Eve's shame and their hiding? Did he want them to just wallow in it? Did he want them to just feel worse about themselves? No. Here's what happened. Look at it closely. Genesis 3 verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent... Because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. He did not curse the man and the woman. He cursed the serpent. And he promised immediately a redemptive son who would one day overturn the serpent's evil, deceptive work. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring, literally, your seed and her seed, and he, the seed of the woman, shall bruise your, and he, the servant, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. You shall crush the, the son of man will crush the serpent's head, and you'll just bruise his heel. God was saying, from the moment that they fell into sin, I have a plan to redeem you. I've got a plan to lift your shame. And then he pictured it in what he did. Look at the grace of God. Look at the grace of God. As soon as sin came in the world, he cursed the serpent who had deceived them. He promised a seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head one day. And then God covered them. God covered their shame. They didn't cover their own shame. They didn't know how. They made some fig leaves for clothing. But at verse 21, the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. It was the first blood sacrifice, and God made the sacrifice, not the people. 
The gospel of Jesus Christ is not about your sacrifice by which you cover your shame. The gospel of Jesus Christ is about the sacrifice that God made in the person of Jesus to cover your shame. He loves you so much. Do you know that there were two goats on the Day of Atonement? On that day of Yom Kippur, as described in Leviticus chapter 16, that day that we remember in the Christian tradition so well because we know and understand about the blood of the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world and how Jesus is the Lamb of God in that sense. We understand that throughout history in the Old Testament, they'd offer blood sacrifice after blood sacrifice in order to temporarily have their sins covered up. But did you know there was a second goat in Leviticus 16.8? He is to cast lots for the two goats, the instructions went to the priest. One lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. And described in verses 9 and 10 what's supposed to happen Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. The scapegoat wasn't killed. Instead, they laid their hands on it and they shamed the goat. They spoke all manner of every kind of shameful thing on that goat. And then they sent it out into the wilderness to be alone. And and in the world, you're going to find this out if you had never seen it before, that people are always looking for a scapegoat. Not knowing how to bring their shame to God and be cleansed by the grace and the mercies of God's love. People... Instead of bringing it to God, we'll take their shame and try to shift it to someone else. That's why there's racism. That's why people put you down. That's why people shame you. It's because of their own shame. And and they're trying to find a scapegoat. Someone who will bear the shame for them. Sometimes in a family, it'll pick out one person and they'll blame everything on this person. So we don't have to talk about all of our other issues Don't ever let anybody make you into a scapegoat. You don't need to be. Jesus has already taken the shame. Because at the cross, Jesus Christ not only became the lamb who shed blood, was the payment for the debt of your sin and mine, but he also was the scapegoat the one upon whom every demon of hell mocked. They just shamed him. They spat on him. They they mocked him as a king, put a crown of thorns on his brow. They, they, They gambled for his clothes. They they left him isolated. It was it was the whole fiery shame of hell that was resting upon Jesus that made the cross so severe. But he went so that you could know for sure you don't have to live like that. You can never escape the voices of shame. There's always going to be some voice. It's like it's in the atmosphere. But you don't have to breathe it in. And it doesn't have to cling to you because Jesus has forgiven you. When you accept Christ, your sin is as far away as the east is from the west. It means that you, baptized into Christ, are clothed with him. That's what Paul said in Galatians 3.27. All of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. God clothed them with animal skins, but it was just a picture of the day that would come in which you're clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You're so accepted that you don't have to worry. 
And the more you walk in the grace of God, the more it just, the stuff doesn't cling to you. I, I'm not perfectly free from shame, but boy, it just doesn't cling to me like it used to. <laughs> I was chuckling with Ann this week, remembering a time, I think our second year of marriage, in which the phone rang in the middle of the night, and she answered and said, hello. And uh, there was a whispering voice on the other end. <laughs> She was so young and sweet and naive. She didn't even know there was such a thing as an obscene collar. And she said, what? <laughs> and the obscene caller said, hush, 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 whispered a little louder. She said, what? <laughs> and she said a third time, he whispered a little bit louder, whatever obscenities and things he was trying to say. Hush, 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 hush. She said a third time, what? Finally, he just spoke up and said, can you not hear me? And she said, oh, I can hear you now. He said, never mind. And hung up. <laughs> I just have a picture for your life that God has intent for you to be so healed by his grace that when the devil comes whispering with the voice of shame, that you almost let him go, what? That doesn't apply to me at all. I'm clothed with Jesus Christ. I've become the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I am not perfect. I fall down a lot, but God loves me perfectly, and I am accepted in the beloved. And when you really get hold of that, then all the shame comes off you, and that's the gospel.